know somebody out there said, that's the old bird up there talking. <laughs> right? No. Okay, I have a few announcements. <clears throat> Remember, Sister Patsy Lane is a, a new great, has a new great grandbaby. Her name is Summer Lane. And that was her granddaughter Chelsea's baby. And remember the BBS evaluation forms are back on the in the foyer on the table and Ron would like to have them back by August the fourth. Remember that. Remember August the 1st, prime timers will get together in the new portion of the building at 6 o'clock for finger foods and fellowship. Next Sunday afternoon will be the jail ministry meeting here at 5 o'clock. And coming up August the 11th, which is a couple of weeks, will be our area-wide youth night here that will begin at 5 o'clock. And then uh, 17th, remember Terry and Connie Cruz, uh, Singing and homemade ice cream begins at 6 o'clock at their house. Bring lawn chairs and anything you like with ice cream. I want to remember tomorrow night, <coughs> the Monday night study group will meet here at 7 o'clock here at the building. And the topic will be, you were chosen. Now what should you put on? And I want to remember, remember to get all of the receipts turned in to Haley by Wednesday night so he can get the monthlies figured out. I want to remember all those in our prayer lists. It's regular lengthy. Uh, I want to remember Marvin's friend Steve Nichols. Uh, he has MSA, which is it causes your muscles to shut down. And he's getting pretty bad quickly, so we want to keep him in our prayers. As well as James Willis, his legs are getting worse. I want to give some prayers to him that he can have his health back. I want to remember Julianne's father-in-law, Mike Moore. He was on our prayer list. Uh, he had a relapse, and he's in Kansas City Hospital on the bent. So I want to keep him in our prayers. as well as <clears throat> Dean Davis. Keep him in your prayers. He is a member of Leon's Parkinson's therapy group. He was diagnosed with MDS, which is a blood cell cancer slimmer, similar to leukemia. He is 88 years old. And keep him in our prayers. So we'll remember June. She is here tonight. I'm glad that she can make it. And she has a card here to my church family. A big thanks to all the flowers, cards, and prayers. When you're in a life and death situation and not really know what's going on until it's all over, you find out what a real church family is all about. And again, a big thanks. And that's from Sister June. I'll post that on the board. Mm, I believe that's all I have. Good evening. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. good. Get this clipped on here. <coughs> All right, we'll, sing, we'll start our singing tonight with Our God's an Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns Several kids called me out on it. So I'll try to sing it now for you. It's uh, Joy, Joy, Joy. So let's sing Joy, Joy, Joy. 
I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to say, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Our song before our opening prayer, we will sing at We Shall Assemble. We shall assemble. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have to come together, Lord, and study your word. Father, we're thankful for this building, and we're thankful for all the members. Father, we just ask you to be with us. Father, we just ask you to be with these kids, and may they take something from this. I ask you to be with those that are on our sick list, Lord, and, and bring them back to their most wanted health. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Our song before Rick's lesson will be I was, or Love Lifted Me, uh, number 453, 453. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply sank within, sinking to rise no
Good evening. How is everyone? Good. We hope you're, you're good. That, I like hearing that good part. Well, hopefully you'll be better when the time we leave this building and the property tonight, especially if you get filled up on watermelon. We want to thank Steve, uh, not Steve for the announcement, thank uh, Tim for uh, tonight bringing watermelon. Last time it was ice cream, but tonight it's watermelon, so we we'll encourage everybody to stay around and uh, participate. I don't think we'll have a seed spitting contest, but I guess we could if we go outside. Except for these seedless watermelons makes the contest kind of rough. When those folks got all those watermelons to compete, they didn't have any seeds. So I don't know what we'll get tonight, but I do know what we're going to talk about tonight, and that's an, an uncommon, common bird. And in order to set the stage for this sermon and lesson for these young people as well as adults, we're going to first... Just to make you aware again, if you don't know, what the fourth Sunday has been on Sunday night is Youth Focus. And what I have been doing is looking at lessons that will reinforce our faith and our confidence and our understanding that God Almighty is the Creator, that He exists, and that we can put our trust and confidence in Him. Because if we don't believe God exists, then we might as well go home, right? And the world will tell us God doesn't exist. But the evidence shows otherwise. And we'll see what we're talking about again tonight by talking about an uncommon, common bird. So I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you have them, turn to Acts 10. We're going to look at a few verses to set the stage for the Bible study. And what we're going to read about is a common bird in Acts chapter 10. Now, how many of you knew in Acts 10 there was a reference to common birds? Well, we're going to see. This is an account where Peter has a vision. The next day as they went on their journey, they drew near the city, Scripture says, and Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Good thing to do. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. And of course, if you're up on a housetop, what are you likely going to see? Birds, yeah, that's pretty common. Now, most of us wouldn't want to go up on our house tops to pray because it's very difficult, number one, to climb ladders and climb those steep roofs that we have around here. But back then, the house top was a place that people would gather. It was designed to have stairways to go up there, a good place to pray, get away from everything. So Peter goes there to pray. It's the sixth hour of the day, which means it's a good time, and he prays. And he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And then scripture says in verse 11 of chapter 10 that he saw the heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound at four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. Now this must have been quite an event that Peter is going to be a part of. And then it says in verse 12 that in it were all kinds of four-footed creatures. Well, animals, it says, of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and then what else? You see them flapping their wings up there, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, verse 13, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. 
But Peter has a little bit of problem about dining on these selections that God has presented before him. And he says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Right. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So what is Peter calling common? Well, what was in the sheets? There were four, all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and in that common list was what? Birds of the air. So in Acts chapter 10, we have reference to common birds. Now, probably this is our most common bird in, in the United States, right? How many of you ate chicken for lunch today? Probably several of you. And one of the things that Peter is learning from God is what God calls clean and what God has cleansed, he's not to call common. In other words, what God has set apart and put his hand on, he was not to call common. Now, we have been blessed in the United States with lots and lots of good birds to eat. How many of you like eating chicken and turkeys and so forth? And they're pretty common, right? There are all kinds of varieties, but there's, they're pretty common. In fact, it's interesting if you go to Wikipedia, that Wikipedia tells us when it comes to common names for birds, there's about 11,000. Now, that's kind of amazing to me, but that's only a, a certain number of species that are recognized. But it's interesting when you look back at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20 that Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. And so they've been named, right? And I don't think that he used the word common. However, today we do. We have 25 North American bird names that are called common. From everything from the common black hawk to the common crow to the name used for this bird that you see in the picture called a common poor wheel. Now, I never have recalled seeing a poor wheel before, and it's probably because they're in western United States. They're not really native to this area. So I've never seen one. I don't recall seeing one in... in the zoo, but there are a lot of common birds that we have around here that use the name common. But the bird I want to talk about is called common, but it's not really common. It's a very uncommon bird, and the reason why is that this is a bird definitely you can determine that God has put his hand on this bird. As we know, the Almighty God was a designer. He engineered creation, didn't he? And one of the things that's so exciting about this bird is that you can clearly see without question this bird, in order for it to exist and do what it does, had to have a creator. It couldn't have done it by accident. And that tells me that Almighty God is the creator because this bird proves it. And that's why it's not a common bird. It's very uncommon. So much so that it has some things that it, that it stands out in that tells us, hey, this had to have God designing it and creating it where it would not exist. What do we mean? Well, when God made his creation, he saw that it was good. And this is a bird that he saw that he created that was good. It's a bird that's known as a seabird. It's a bird that's found in the, you can see the regions in blue around the uh, Pacific and also the Atlantic coast up into uh, the area of Alaska and over into Russia and the Siberian area. It's common. There's a lot of these birds around. They're not in danger of extinction. And one of the reasons for that is because they are so fantastically created. They are a marvel. And when you learn about these birds, you just have to go back and go, wow. God must have created this bird. Well, I didn't know about this bird up until we made a trip to Alaska just a few weeks ago. I don't even know if I could have 
even say I ever heard of the name before. And you would think such a bird that's so uncommon among common birds that I would have heard about it, but if they taught that bird or told us about that bird in school, I slept through it or was absent that day because I hadn't heard about this bird until the trip to Alaska. And the reason we encountered this bird was because we took a cruise, on an eight-hour cruise, on a boat out into the Gulf of Alaska through Resurrection Bay. As you can, I don't know if you can see it on the map, probably not, but in the area of those lines there. And as a part of that experience, we got to visit their nesting place that's in the area of uh, the Kenai Peninsula. And it was quite fascinating because here I learned, and I'll share this with you in a little bit, of, uh, about this bird uh, from the captain of the boat. And I'm gonna, I've am gonna i got a recording of his, his, his talking about this bird, and you'll see why it caught my attention. But you will see that unfold as we look at this seabird. And it's called a common myrrh. And kind of a simple name, common myrrh. And it is common in the sense that there's a lot of these birds, but when it comes to God putting his hand on this bird, it's not common. This is a very fascinating bird. We got to see this bird on this boat right here. We uh, took a cruise, got on the boat, headed out uh, into the Gulf of Alaska and made our way over to where this bird lives. And we were excited because we knew we were going to go see puffins. How many of you have seen puffins in the zoo or maybe in Alaska or somewhere, and probably Tim has, but we wanted to see puffins. I would, didn't have this bird on my radar, but it makes the puffin look like nothing when it comes to how magnificently God created this bird. And as you can see there, uh, Kathy, hopefully you can see her pretty well, she's all grins. She's excited about getting on this boat because she can swim. Now the folks that couldn't swim were a little apprehensive but that wasn't me. I was excited about getting on the boat. We had a, several folks after we got going that wished they'd never got on it because we got on the ocean and the winds were up and you know what happens with you get on the ocean the boat goes like this. And what happens when your boat goes like this? Seasick. And you've been there and done that. Well, we made our way to, to see the MERS. And as you look at this picture right here on the right at the top, this is the cliff area where the MERS nest. They go here to nest and they nest on ledges and they gather on these ledges so we made our way to go see these birds that live on the edge and they do during their nesting time. They literally are on the edge because this is their nesting grounds. And these birds are about 18 inches long and they'll gather in, in groups like you can see on the, on the right side of the screen or left side of the screen and they're, they're stacked there pretty pretty tightly now can I ask you a question do you see any nest there no but they are there this is what fascinated me now Luke chapter 9 and verse 58 tells us that Jesus said foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests so this tells me that, yes, if these birds reproduce, then they have nests, right? So where are they? Well, they got to be rare somewhere because if you look at the arrow right there, what do you see? You see a baby bird. Yeah, a baby bird. There it is. So apparently they have nests somewhere. Well, they nest in these cliffs. Well, where at? Right on the edge. Remember what we said? They live on the edge and they lay the, the mother lays one egg the hen lays one egg lays it right there on the ledge you'll notice there's no nest like we would normally see normally birds do what but they do Nathan they take and they gather up sticks and limbs and all that these birds just lay it right there on the ledge do you see a problem with that it might fall off, but God took care of it. And this is one of the things that I learned about this bird is that truly God was the designer of this bird because this couldn't be without God's intervention. You'll see what I mean. Now, let's go here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2 gives us a lesson. We as 
young people and even as adults, we have a responsibility to honor our fathers and mothers. So God designed that man leave his father and mother, woman leaves her father and mother, and they become one, and they have children. Same thing for these birds. These birds mate, and so they together will sit on the nest and incubate the egg, and they lay one egg, and then they take turns making sure that egg is taken care of and incubated and keeping it warm and it takes about 28 to 37 days and the baby hatches but again here we have this amazing thing what keeps the eggs from rolling off the cliff well I'm gonna get a little help here you can come up here Wyatt I think one bag will do it well, give everybody, if you would, give everybody an egg. Sitting up front here. If, if you as an adult would like to have an egg, just raise your hand. If you, some of y'all brought your eggs, I see, already. We'll let, let them get, get, their, uh, get their eggs. All right, has everybody got one? Did y'all get an egg? Okay, good. All right, Parker, why don't you come up here and help me? Okay, what I would like for you to do is put your egg right there on, on the edge. I'm gonna put my... See, this is uh, typically shaped, they shape these pretty much after a chicken egg, right, Wyatt? And, and chickens build what kind of nest? They use a straw or some kind, or they'll put it on the ground somewhere, but usually it's got some resistance, and so the mama, she's watching over it a lot, right? And now, if you're all crowded together on a ledge like these two birds right here, what can easily happen to these eggs? They can fall off. Yeah, why don't you tap that egg and let's see where it goes. Now, that was a fortunate egg because it rolled backwards. And then, of course, if we had a ledge right here, <laughs> and we had these two eggs right here on the edge, and Mom's sitting there on the ledge, now tap those eggs. Let's see what happens. Just give it a, give it a good win. Uh-oh. Okay, there's the idea. Problem, right? Because what's going to happen to those little babies? Um, they're going to crash because it's a long way to the bottom. If you remember, look at those ledges, and you'll see this in the video I'm going to show you. The, the nests are up high. They're, they're there for prevention of predators or anything else from getting the eggs and they lay those eggs on the edge and they're right there with them on the ledge and, and, then, and if they roll they're going to get a big problem. So thank you Parker, appreciate that. Oh, let me get your egg back. Did you get your egg back? Here you go. Oh you got it. Okay. Good. Uh, the interesting thing about a myrrh egg is that it has a unique shape that God designed in order to accommodate the birds who were going to nest on the edge. Now, you might be thinking, well, why don't they just lay eggs where they live at normally? Well, that would be a big problem, too, because does anybody here know where the myrrh lives when it's not on, nesting on the ledge? It is a seabird. And the only reason they come to land is to nest. Otherwise, they're out in the sea. Now, I didn't know that either, but they live out in the sea. What happens if mama lays an egg on, on the, in the sea? <laughs> yeah, it's not in good shape. It's going, to, it's going to sink and become food for other predators. So that doesn't work out so well. So they go to the ledges and they nest along the coast. And the unique shape of the egg is what makes the difference. Now, White has brought with him some eggs. 
So we're going to let him show us some eggs and tell us about these eggs. And I want you to notice carefully the shape of the egg. So this one is an emu egg. So emu eggs, they, they live in the jungle and, and uh, uh, well, they, they live in various parts of Australia. Um, some of it's jungle, some of it's out in the brush. Um, but for the most part, when they make a nest, they make it kind of with some old, uh, old jungle leaves and stuff like that. So their, their eggs want to be kind of a greenish, dark color. Most predators are, you know, either color blind or they're color impaired. And so this color basically allows those eggs to blend in and be much harder to spot um, to then find them and eat them. And there's a lot of good nutrients in this egg. This is the world's, the, the second largest egg in the animal kingdom uh, for as far as birds wise. Now the largest egg in the animal kingdom would be that of what? An ostrich, that's right. Good job. So this is an ostrich egg. So. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to let you guys hold it, but this thing's older than I am, so we, we need to take care of it. Um, but the ostrich lays the largest egg. Now, when the ostrich lays an egg, they just kind of lay it out in the sand or in the, in the kind of the dirt, right? Because they live in usually pretty arid, uh, dry can places where they don't really have too many chances to have too many sticks. And there's not too many things that are going to mess with an ostrich that's protecting her eggs. So what kind of color is this? It's a tan, yes. It's kind of a beige, a... Uh, 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 more sand dirt color right because they want it to blend into the ground and in that way they can they can sit on it they'll, of course they'll have a whole, you know several of these eggs all close close together there um, but these are quite large eggs because they're going to make quite large birds and um, uh, you can also tell that these ones are, are not really like as sharply nose pointed as that one or uh, you know an egg an egg uh, chicken egg that you pick up from your chickens might be a little more conular. Well, this one's nice and round because they want to stay all kind of tucked upright around one another. They don't want them rolling out or, you know, the wind blowing them because they do live in some windy places sometimes because they don't have as much cover. Um, but yeah, so, so if we, if we kind of compare these two, look at how their shape's a little different. I mean, ultimately it looks like an egg. They're both kind of roundish, uh, conular, but, but ultimately this one's meant to sit upright and these ones kind of all sit to their side and stay in that way. And, and of course they have to, the, mo the mother has to rotate the eggs to make sure the embryo develops correctly anyway. So. But they're not going to roll out a nest because they're putting in nests, right? Yeah. So if yeah. we put that on the edge of the table. <laughs> yeah. Let's not do that. Not yeah. Okay. Yeah, these would roll, very, this one especially would roll quite well. <laughs> and what, you've already mentioned about the, the ostrich egg coloring. What about the emu coloring? What is that design? Do. Usually most has the or yeah, well, this is what bl jungle, it blends in kind of with the jungle or lower. And I, actually, if you look at uh, rhea or cassowary, the cassowaries live distinctly in the jungle. They eat almost all fruit-based stuff. Uh, they're along a lot on the, uh, the east coast of Australia. And um, they will have very, very strong green coloration like that. Um, these are from some of our own, which just live not in the jungle, but they're inherently designed to, to make that pattern. That's the, the pattern that they lay. Um, Rhea, Rhea's, they have a kind of similar pattern because they live in the jungle as well, just like the cassowaries. Very good. Thank you. Brian. Yeah. Now what I'd like you to do is take your hand and put it right on the edge of the fuse, the edge of the fuse, and, and then I want you to carefully roll it forward so it goes to the ground. See how long it takes. Roll. If you notice, if you put it on that fuse, it's going to roll anyway. You don't even have to touch it. It's going to take off rolling. And once again, <laughs> they drop it. So how did God deal with this bird's eggs that can't afford to lose their one egg? You know, if you have several of them, I guess, hey, Charlie's gone. That's okay. We'll, we'll have Bill over here. Well, with one egg, that egg... If it's lost, that couple doesn't bear young. And so this egg is designed in a, in a what we would almost say a, a pyramid type or a triangle type shape. It's very long. And so when it rolls, here's the thing that you want to remember. God designed this bird's egg so that when it's laid on the ledge and it gets bumped, and it does, it's going to roll in a circle. 
So if you hit that egg, it's going to roll in a very, very tight circle. Well, why would that circle over there have to be tight? So it doesn't fall off the ledge. So it will just roll around. And so they do get pushed around, but the good part is God designed this one egg that this bird has to survive being pushed around. To me, that is just tremendously amazing and definitely shows just like the ostrich egg and, and the emu egg and uh, the other eggs in nature that God's hand was involved in what we call common that's certainly uncommon. Now, but that's not all about the eggs. The eggs are laid all over the ledges by the, by the hens, the mothers, and they're watched over by the parents, but the eggs sometimes will either roll together, I've seen pictures of them rolled up together, with several of them rolled together, or they'll start out like this and they'll roll up together, or they'll be just spread out. And so the challenge is, which egg belongs to which couple? How are they going to know? Have you noticed something about the eggs? Looks like, that looks like they've had some pretty good paint job, right? But there's something unique about these eggs that allows the parents to be able to identify the egg. Now, how many of you know what you can do if you put ink on your, on your finger like this and you press it down on the paper, what's it going to make an imprint of? Fingerprint. What's unique about a fingerprint? Okay, very good. Nobody has the same fingerprint. So it can be used to identify you because of its uniqueness. The MERS eggs are their fingerprints. Every egg is different. And the parents can identify which egg belongs to them because of its unique fingerprint. Now here uh, is an illustration. This gives us uh, the size of the egg. It's about two and a half inches long. And notice they're all different colors. There's kind of a, a whole run of colors. But it's more importantly than their colors, look at the blotches on it. We wouldn't look at that and say, wow, that's interesting. But every one of those patterns are very unique to that couples birds and so therefore because of that they can identify their birds now in Matthew 23 verse 37 we also learn something significant about a chicken with reference to uh, what Jesus says when he says oh Jerusalem Jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks. Notice the words plural under her wings, but you were not willing. Chicks, multiples. But when it comes to the mers, they have one egg in their nesting season and they have one bird. And so they make sure and take care of that one bird. And because of that, they watch after that bird so that they make sure that bird survives. Now, what's interesting about these birds being raised on the ledge, what can happen to those birds, little ones? You gotta watch them, because you know, kids wander around. How many of y'all used to wander off when you were little and your mom had to go chasing you down? It happens. Well, they also have a problem with that, to the point that when, as they grow and get bigger, they like most kids, they wanna, they wanna wow. get around, move around, fly around. And so the, the chicks are not called fledglings, like birds are, they're called jumplings. And we're gonna find out a little bit more why that's true. Because what happens is, is they try to fly before they can fly. Now, you'll see in a moment where they're at and why that's not a good idea exactly, but you'll learn what God has created for them and created them as in order to be able to be jumplings rather than fledglings. And so we're gonna look at this video and I took this on the boat and it came out a whole lot better than I thought it was going to, 
And so I think you're going to learn some things that I learned for the first time that caused me to go, wow. And we'll probably need some sound on this one. I, uh, go ahead and do the other one, Luther. That's okay, we can watch this. This, is, this one here is of the, the bird swimming. the car I want the keys to fly but when they take off it just doesn't work and so they end up learning to fly underwater before they learn to swim which is the way God designed it he took care of these birds and as it turns out once they got in the water they decide they like it a whole lot and so when they leap off it turns out to be good so they leap off the edge, and they say, it's funny, I, I didn't get to see any leaping. They weren't ready to leap when we were there. I'd love to be there when they start doing that, because sometimes they'll take off, and they'll do real fine. They'll make the perfect dive. Sometimes they belly flop, and sometimes they bang and bump their way down the side of the mountain. But they end up in the water, and there they start flying, but it's in the water. And, and we saw a little bit of that video. There's no point in seeing that again. But they hit the water, and they find out, hey, we're, we're equipped for, for deep-sea diving. And they will go to spending time swimming. That's important because, remember, they're sea creatures. They're designed by God to be in the ocean. And the great thing about it is they have the ability to go after food as deep as they want to go. They can dive for three minutes holding their breath, which is phenomenal, and can go as far as 600 feet. And like he said in, in, in the video, uh, he, they're the deepest diving flying bird there is. The only one that can dive deeper is the penguin, but it doesn't fly. This bird flies. And, but they're perfectly suited for diving in water, and they can do it very quickly. As you can see the graphic there showing the bird, boom, uh, just shooting on down there. Which brings us to this. What does this mean? Well, hopefully you've been amused at some of the facts. I was going, wow, wow, I didn't know about this about this bird. But what does that translate to? For me, what does it mean to you? And we think about an egg designed so it won't fall off a ledge, a bird that can go 600 feet down in the water. What does this mean to me? Well, in Job, we get an answer. 
If you look at Job chapter 12, verse 7, Scripture says, But now ask the beast, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air. Tonight, what were we taught by? The birds of the air. But this particular bird is not just a bird of the air, it's a bird of the sea that can dive. A bird that is very unique in its beginnings as an egg to the method it uses to learn to fly by learning to fly underwater. And that's important. Verse goes on, 8, or speak to the earth and it will teach you and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know the hand of the Lord has done this. How can you learn about this bird and not recognize that God created this bird? How can a person walk away and say, yeah, that just happened by accident? I'm afraid what an accident would have produced and that would have been a dead bird. God created a bird that can live in strange conditions and reproduce and do so and prosper. Who among you all these does not know the hand of the Lord has done this and whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? You know what that means? That means you and me. Breathe in real deep for us. Where'd you get that breath? Yeah, air, but who created the air? He gave that breath to you, didn't he? Just like he gave life to this bird. He is the giver of our life. And how can we say, no, God didn't do this. It all happened by accident. There was this big old bang and it all blew up. Once again, where did all that stuff come from that created the bang? Does that make any sense? It's more sensible to believe that power, God created, force created, rather than just something exploding. In Psalms 139, verse 14, I will praise you, I, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This bird is fearfully and wonderfully made, but think about us. All that goes into us, that's another lesson after lesson after lesson. But look at this. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. How can you look at this bird that we looked at tonight and not know? There is a creator. In Acts 11, Peter gives us information telling about what happened in Acts 10 with the situation with the unclean animals and the common animals. And it was all a lesson to teach one very important thing to Peter and also to the Jews that would follow. And that is that God had granted to the Gentiles life eternal. That the Gentiles were, as Paul would write, engrafted, given opportunity for salvation. That's a, the lesson that we see there, but we also know that whatever God puts his hand on as creator, it's not ordinary, is it? It's not common. We may name a bird common, Myrrh, but that bird's anything but common. And because it's uncommon and has the hand of the Creator upon it, it tells me that I have a responsibility to God. And tonight we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation song, and if you're here and you know your responsibility, but you haven't yet accepted that, we want to encourage you to consider it as we will sing this invitation song. And if you're here tonight and you are not been living the Christian life, when you think about just that bird, and the fact that it testifies strongly and loudly that God exists, and that means I'm responsible to that God, it causes me to think, maybe I need to do something about my life if I'm not walking with God. So how's your walk? Think about it as we stand and sing this invitation. Would you come? So glad morning when this life is over.
up. I want to go back here to verse 2 because it didn't show up on the screen. But I want you to look at this verse right here before I walk away tonight. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. But the very reality that that bird can learn to fly in the water gives me assurance that this is true. This evening, it wasn't able to take the Lord's Supper this morning. I mean, I can take of it now. Please raise your hand if you did. Okay, there's one. Okay, if you would please. We thank you, our Father, that we have the opportunity to gather together. As we, as a, as a family, now get to commune with one of our brothers as he remembers what Jesus has done for him. We're so thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made the shedding of his blood, the, the giving of his life so that we might live. We're so thankful that he has given us that example. Now, as, he, as we take of this bread at this time, we pray that, you will, that he will do it in a way that will bring glory and honor unto Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And in like manner, Father, we are so thankful for the, for the blood that was shed. For there's that blood that cleanses us from our sins. We're so thankful that Jesus was willing to pay that price so that we can be his brethren and we can be your children. Thankful for, for the opportunity we have to remember what he's done for us. And now as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we pray, Father, that you know, what he did will be brought back to our memory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray now, Father, as we have the opportunity to gather around this table once more time. This time is to give to your, the working of this congregation. We're thankful for, for the gifts that was given. And now we pray, Father, that, that the elders will use this money wisely so that your congregation, your church, can continue to grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Rick, for excellent lesson. <clears throat> yeah. Thought that was a good yoke. Or, uh, <clears throat> might crack you up. No. <clears throat> you know, and the wise men knew about him because they, they brought frankincense and myrrh to Jesus' birth, right? Yeah. No. Not the common myrrh, though. So, All right, our closing song this evening will be 768. 768. Jesus, let us.
Would you please bow with me? Our most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and the blessings you so bountifully bestow upon us. And we pray as we go forth this week, as we strive to be your children, that our light would shine so all those around us would know we are your children. Be with us in all things as we strive to be those children you'd have us be. Thank you so much for prayers answered on our behalf. And we can pray continually that you be with all those on our prayer list. Be with them all. That they might regain that much wanted help. Bless us in your service. Watch over and guide us. All these things we ask in your most precious and righteous son's name, Jesus. Amen.